It is great to be together today. I'm so glad that you are here so we could worship our Lord together. What a, what a fabulous day. I hope you've been enjoying the out of doors lately. And it is good that this morning to gather in the name of Jesus and to celebrate the comfort and the peace and the joy that we have only through him. So welcome in the name of the Lord. It is good to be together. Let's join our voices together with the call to worship uh, from your bulletin in Psalm, excuse me, Proverbs 2, 3 through 6. If you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for many then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. This morning we'll be looking at scriptures that, that speak to us about the mystery of God. And the mystery of God that has now been revealed in Jesus. So we, we are looking at scriptures and even songs about how do we deal with the mysteries of our lives. Especially the, the difficulties of our lives. So we, we look this morning. We come expectantly asking God to show us what he has for us this morning. So as we begin, let me begin us in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you that you call us together. We are your people. We are those who have, are being called closer to you. So thank you for each person here. I pray that we would all have a fresh experience of your grace this morning. Wherever we find ourselves, uh, whatever we've done, whoever we are, we come open-handed to you this morning. And we seek you. We call for insight. We raise our voices and we ask you, Lord, to show us your wisdom, your kindness, your love, your care. Thank you that you are awesome and you are good. So we, we raise our voices together. Would you be pleased, because not because we are anything special in of ourselves, but because you have made us your people and you have made us special. You have made us beautiful. So help us to enjoy you today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing a song, How Great Is Our God. It's found in your bulletin. It starts on the first page and continues to the next. So please stand with me and let's sing together how great is our God.
Amen. Well, let's turn to another hymn. Uh, please open your hymn books in front of you to hymn page 250. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Hymn page 250. through prayer, through singing, as God's grace is on display here today. And we remember that His grace, as the song says, is greater than all of our sins. So that assumes that we are bringing our sin to Him to be forgiven. The scriptures say, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Will you... Avail yourself of God's grace this morning. Let's take a few moments of silence individually at this time. Lord, we come to the quiet and sometimes... Quiet makes us nervous because we're not sure what we'll find there. But thank you that you are here in the quiet. You are also in the noise. But we quiet our hearts before you so we might hear those things that you have to say to us. So forgive us our many sins and speak to us that we may hear your voice. 
Thank you that we are assured of, the for, of your forgiveness as we bring our sins to you. We remember that the wages of our sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thank you for this amazing promise. We stand upon it this morning and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's raise our voices one more time. You can stay seated at this time, but let's turn to hymn page 426, and we will be singing, I Want Jesus to Walk With Me. As you know, I've been, I put in a, a bulletin announcement. If you have any favorite hymns that you would like us to sing together, I would love to, to hear about that. Uh, this is my the first one that someone has requested, and it fit very well in this service, so... Um, if you have a favorite hymn that you would like to include in the service, I would love to hear it from you. But let's turn to hymn page 426 to sing, I Want Jesus to Walk With Me. for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I am a, become a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning anyone, everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I told, struggling with all his energy that it powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches 
of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Amen. Thank you, Mill. This is the word of the Lord. It is true. It is trustworthy and it will change our lives and our hearts. We will be looking a little closer at this passage in a few moments. At this time, we'll have our offering. If the ushers would please come forward. If you are our guest this morning, please don't feel obligated to contribute to the work of the church. We are just glad that you're here. And But if you are a member of the church, this is now your opportunity to contribute to the work that God is doing as he lays on your heart. So will the ushers come forward at this time? And this is an old hymn called Under His Wings. Under His wings I am safely abiding, though the night deepens and tempests are wild. Still I can trust Him. I know he will keep me, he has redeemed me, I am his child. Under his wings, under his wings, who from his love can sever? Under his wings, my soul shall abide, safely abide.
20. All right, I'll do 20. And you can hide anywhere uh, in the chapel here. All right, you ready? And um, this right here is, is the base. This right here. So have you played hide and seek with a, with a base? No, that's how we used to play. Now you got a lot. You just got a lot to learn. No. Um, when there's hide and seek with a base, you go hide, and I try to find you. But if you make it back to the base and, and hold on to this before I tag you, then you are safe and you win. Can you do that? You want to try that? <laughs> what? All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna count. So you guys go hide. You ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Let's see, where did they go? They're under the piano. No. Are they under a bench here? I don't think they could have gotten that far. Oh, Annabelle's right there! <laughs> Tag. <laughs> oh, there's one. Tag. Got to say that. All right, now we gotta find Gideon. Oh, I see Gideon under there. Oh. All right, Gideon wins. Good job. Okay, if we were, if we were in the playground, then you'd be the counter, but maybe later. Um, so why are we doing hide and seek this morning? Well, uh, when Milton had the scriptures, it talked about God's mystery that's been hidden for a long time. That God has given us a mystery over the years, over thousands of years, that was hidden. It's like hiding, right? Ever, sometimes you ever think that God is hiding? Because you can't see him. So sometimes it feels like he's hiding. Well, back before Jesus came, his mystery was hidden. But then... Jesus was the mystery that was revealed. That's what our Bible passage said today. The mystery, yeah. The mystery has been revealed in Jesus. God's love, God's grace, God's forgiveness has been revealed in Jesus. It's like it was hidden for many, many, many years with some hints and some clues. And then Jesus came and said, I am the mystery. So the mystery of God. God might seem like he's hidden now, but he is for everyone to see. Because we can hear about him and read about him in the scriptures, and we know that's true, and we see him at work in his spirit, even here among us and in our hearts. So when we might think we're playing hide and seek with God, and maybe sometimes we are. I was reading a little story that a kid was very upset because nobody came to find him. Have you ever had that when you were playing hide and seek and no one comes to find you, you feel a little sad? Well, we can, sometimes we can feel that way, but God says, I am coming to find you. I was the mystery and now I am coming to find you. I will seek you and I will find you. And he calls us to seek him and find him too. Well, that's, thanks for playing hide and seek. You guys can, maybe, I don't, you have to ask Katie. Maybe you can play more hide and seek at Sunday school. I don't know. There's plenty more rooms to hide in over there, but... Uh, Anyways, well, thanks for playing hide-and-seek with me. That's what I have for you this morning, and let me pray for you, and we can go off to Sunday school. Father in heaven, thank you that you sent Jesus to be found by us. Will you help us to, to find you and your amazing love in Jesus? And would you come and find us? Thank you that you love us so much that even though you were so often mysterious, you, you are just excited when you're found by us. So help us to find you, and would you find us too? I pray for these kids. I thank you for each one. I pray that you would help them to grow in your love and your grace more and more. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks kids. See you next time. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, let's open our scriptures once again. You, can, you have it in your insert here. Uh, you, if you've been with us, you'll 
see here. There we go. If you've been with us over the last, I don't know how long it's been, a month or so, we've been doing a, a, a walk through the book of Colossians. And Colossians is a, a short book, it's a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to uh, a church in this little town in what is now modern-day Turkey. And so this is a letter to a Christian church, and Paul's just getting started, really. We walk really slowly through this because there's, if you walk slowly through the scriptures, there's a lot that you can pick up uh, as the Spirit reveals to you. Sometimes it's great to read a, read a whole book in one sitting, and sometimes it's good to just sit with one little phrase. And so we kind of split the difference there, we're just doing a handful of verses. Uh, so this morning we are coming, we've come to Colossians 1, 24. And, it here. and I didn't get past the first, what, the sixth word here without needing to stop and stare for a while. It says, now I rejoice in my sufferings. And what kind of crazy person rejoices in sufferings? I don't know about you, but to me, that always makes me stop and pause and wonder what in the world is going on. Um, not that long ago, I guess it was about six years ago, we had come, uh, Michelle and I and, and our family had come through a, a period, well me personally, had come through a period of just a real rough time. And uh, God had, had kind of lifted me up out of that, I, I, was, I had experienced some depression and all sorts of just dark times. And we had health struggles in our family. And so I came to this sort of new chapter in my life, and I started asking, why suffering? Why, God, do we have to suffer in this world? And you, know, you look at the news with the wildfires and the shootings and the hurricanes, and why is there messed up stuff in this world? So when I came to that phase in my life, and I, I don't often journal. I usually like start, and it's like good for a couple weeks, and then, then there's like a two-year gap. But when I started this, uh, this new phase in life, I was just writing, why, you know, why, God, do you have call your people to suffer? So I would come across this type of verse and just kind of shake my head. But there's a, it's actually a theme in Scripture that we are to rejoice in suffering. So I want to take a few moments here this morning to really... Dig into that. Um, if you notice in your handout, I've got we've got three points: rejoicing and suffering, uh, power and struggle, Christ in you. And really, the first point is where I'm going to spend most of our time. So, if you're a if you're a clock watcher, and like, wait a second, he's on the second point yet. Yeah, don't worry, we'll go through the second and third points a little quick, more quickly. But <laughs> but really, the point of suffering, at least in Paul's case here, is to be a blessing to others. And he's, he's not complaining, he's not, uh, he's not just trying to grit his teeth and endure it, he's not trying to ignore it, but he is rejoicing in the fact that he has gone through suffering. If you look at the little cover that I, I always try to find some image for you on the cover here, that's an artist's rendition of the Apostle Paul in prison. So he's writing these words to his people and now to us. Maybe something like that, I, it's, a, it's an artist's rendition. He was in chains. He probably, he, he probably had uh, some help to write this down. But here's a man rejoicing in suffering from a prison. To me, that doesn't make much sense. And maybe it makes sense to some of us, but I think the fact that it doesn't make sense will just invites us to stop and think and pray and ask God, what is going on here? And this is... A theme that's common in the scriptures, uh, in Acts 5.41, um, the, the apostles were beaten by the, the, by the religious leaders. And then they left the presence of the council, and it says, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. They were so excited that they got to suffer for Jesus. Does anybody else here ever experience that? Because <laughs> I don't. So what, what does this have what is up with this is basically the, I guess, one way to say it. Why is suffering so common and so normal? And but yet, what should our reaction be to it? Well, did you see in the, right after it says, now I rejoice in my sufferings, Paul says, 
for your sake. Paul suffered for his friends. And by extension, for us. Because if he wasn't suffering in prison, we wouldn't have a lot of the letters that he wrote. And God has used these letters to build our faith. And he was like a little bit like Jesus. Because we know the gospel is about Jesus suffering on the cross so we might receive God's forgiveness and joy. So just as Paul was suffering for his friends, he was being a little bit like Jesus who suffered for us. Now the source of Paul's joy isn't the sufferings themselves, but the results of the suffering, the fruits of the suffering. Now um, yesterday we were, um, we happened to be in Weston, Vermont, and we were walking around, took some pictures, and maybe you've seen them. Um, and there was, there's a bunch of apple trees where we were, and uh, if you look at this one apple tree at the base of it, it's completely cracked open and hollow, and it looks like it's this close to being dead. The tree, you look at it and you say, well, that's a dead tree. Because the, the insides of it were gone. But then you look up, and the thing was loaded with amazing apples. Now, to me, I was, it was just a picture of that tree is suffering, quote unquote. But yet there is fruit, an abundance of fruit that's going on in that tree. Isn't that a, a bit of a picture of what God is, is doing here? Paul is suffering. He, he was, if you read his story, there's a lot of the, he, he mentions different things through some of the smaller books in the Bible, but if you read the story of Acts, you see he was beaten to an inch of his life a bunch of times. And he was shipwrecked, he was beaten by a cobra or something, a snake. And it was just, it's almost absurd how much this guy went through. And yet there was amazing fruit in his life. And I want that for us here. I want that for you. I want that for me. Where, yes, we are going to go through suffering. Perhaps in our lives personally. Perhaps in our families. Perhaps in our extended families. Perhaps here as a church body. We are going to encounter the challenges of this life. But will we, can we see that God will use that to produce fruit? That takes eyes of faith. If we are encountering our suffering, and, you know, I, my parents happen to be here today, by the way, but it's, it's, it's a great day that we're spending the weekend together, and I, I was just reflecting, like, I grew up, uh, in an amazingly blessed house, home. There was really, I didn't really experience that I can remember any, <coughs> any real suffering as a child. And many of, some of our stories uh, aren't, aren't there. Some of us suffered, understood suffering really early in our lives. So when I was growing up and, and you know, getting college age and beyond, I, I looked at these passages about suffering and I'm like, I have no idea what that is. And then, but then you live a little bit longer. Somebody accused me. Did you know that somebody accused me of being in my 20s? <laughs> Do I really look like I'm in my 20s? Well, I'm almost 41 now, so I've lived a little bit, and I've experienced a bit of my share of suffering. And I know most of us have experienced your share of suffering, one way or another. And sometimes we don't know. Sometimes we just don't know why. We don't know the fruit, but isn't it amazing that Paul could see, he had eyes of faith to see this suffering that I'm experiencing is producing fruit one way or another, producing fruit for my friends. So this is God's great mystery. As we continue to look at the, at the scripture here, it talks about God's great mystery. This is God's great mystery. Christ in you. And Christ in you means suffering because we serve a suffering Savior. So God is revealing this mystery partly through the things that we go through. Christ in you. So think a moment, if you will, about the last time you experienced what you might call suffering. 
So what's the last time you experienced? Maybe you're in it right now. What is the what how is what is your heart's reaction? What is your what is your instinct doing when you experience suffering? Now we've got the usual, you know. I've, I've done all these, so I'll, I'll, I'll own them. Like self-pity, uh, self-medicate, you know, chocolate, <laughs> movies, and all the worst stuff. You know, there's, you just you go down the list. Self-pity, self-medicate, or just plain old freaking out, just like, I just, I'm freaking out right now, I can't handle this. There's all this range of, of normal human reactions when we suffer. But then we come across this and see rejoicing. And to me that I can't get there unless God himself is working in my heart. Because my normal reaction is all that other stuff. But if God is working in my, if God's working in your heart, you can rejoice no matter what. Because you're following in Jesus' footsteps. You're following in Paul's footsteps. Only by having your hearts and lives changed by Jesus can you really have joy in suffering. And I, I want that for me. I want that for you. I want that for us. Because things will happen. Things are happening. And I want our faith to be having the eyes of faith to see Jesus in, in His grace through our suffering. Your suffering is achieving an eternal purpose. You're not alone in your suffering. You have comfort and peace now. Paul says it like this in the book of Romans. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. Now when you're in the middle of something, it, feels, it, just, it can overwhelm you. But if we have an eternal perspective, the glory that will be revealed in us, that helps us realize God is with me now and He's, gonna, he's bringing me through and He is going to reveal the glory, the amazing awesomeness of himself, so we can have faith, even in the middle of suffering. God's great mystery is Christ in you. And I came across this uh, passage in 1 Peter. It says, After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will restore you, he will confirm you, he will strengthen you, he will establish you. Those are God's promises for us. You know, we, we can read, uh, and oh, these days you can watch it on YouTube or whatever, uh, the amazing stories of, of God's people enduring uh, suffering. You may know the story of uh, Glory Tenbu. I'm sure I've mentioned her before. Um, she was, if you haven't heard her story, she was a, a Dutch a young woman and her family was in the, caught in the middle of World War II. They uh, famously hid... Uh, no, wait, I'm making some of my stories out. Yeah? Mm -hmm. It's all right? That's right, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, they, they hid the hiding place, right? Where we did she, and she hid the, um, hid the Jewish people in their, uh, this, in their closet, and they had like an expert build it. It's like really cool how they did that. But then they were taken away. They were taken away to the concentration camp. And her suffering there, she watched her sister die, and she survived. And then later, fast forward her story, and she was able to meet one of her. God worked in her heart. She was, this is, I'm fast forwarding it so quickly, but God worked so powerfully in her heart while she was in the midst of suffering, but even afterwards, too, when she met a Nazi guard who she knew was partly responsible for killing her sister. She knew she knew Jesus well enough, she knew her scriptures well enough that she needed to forgive this man, but she didn't want to. She did not want to. Who would? But if you hear her tell her story, maybe I'll put it up on a video sometime soon. She had God's presence come to her, and it sounded like, I can't remember the exact words she used, it sounded like God extended her arm for her so she could extend forgiveness to this man who'd done the worst of the worst of the worst. And she said that I didn't do it, God did it in me. That is a glimpse 
of God's powerful work. He can overcome the suffering. And he can even work through and the fruit that was produced by even just telling that story. But even in those lives is amazing. So rejoicing in suffering, I look at it at first and I just shake my head. But you stop and you consider what the resources that we have in Christ. And we can do it. We can do it. Rejoice in suffering. But in a certain sense, how? Uh, and the, the story I just told of, of Corey Denbo, which I'm sure I've messed up the details, sorry about that. Um, how does this happen? Well, if you look in verse, um, where did it go? If you look in verse 29 of chapter 1, and there's a key verse here that Says, Paul says, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works in me. Whose energy? God's energy. Whose power? God's power. But where is it being worked in? Works in me. God's energy, God's power works in me. And the, the language here is actually stronger than it appears. He's talking about like agonizing. Paul is toiling and struggling and agonizing for these people. And you're like, what is he doing anyway? Is he like, is he building something? Like, he's doing like this agony. Because, well, partly because he suffered in different ways, but he is agonizing over their souls. He's the shepherd of their souls, and he's so eager to build up their souls. He's agonizing. It's a struggle for Paul to do what he's called to do. But it's Jesus' energy. Now, the reason that I shake my head when I first see this and say, uh, no, there's no way I can rejoice in suffering. There's really no way I can do what Paul is, is doing here. It's like super special, right? We're just going to leave that to him, and we're just going to say it to him, and we'll be done. No. Paul is saying, Paul is showing us that we can rejoice in suffering. We can do the agony the toil, the struggle of this Christian life, but not in our own energy. It's like the conduit. You know what, you know what I'm saying when I say conduit? You probably have some. Like, you know. <laughs> yeah, there's one. Yeah, there's a conduit right there. Yeah. Uh, coming to the exit sign there. But it's sort of a conduit. It might be a cover type. But anyway, it's a conduit. It's just a pipe, right? Where the stuff inside is being conducted through the pipe. And it's, uh, there's wires in that pipe going to the exit sign, in case in the unlikely event of emergency, you would go <laughs> that direction, because we have the exit sign there. The conduit, it's like we, in some sense, we are the conduit, and Jesus' energy is flowing through us. Jesus, and Jesus' power, that he powerfully works in Paul, is the same power that is for us. Or another uh, metaphor that Paul uses is the jars of clay, right? And I, I couldn't find a, a, a nasty enough looking jar. But I think he's talking about just a common, regular old jar that doesn't look anything, no big deal. This is from 2 Corinthians. He says, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power of God belongs to God and not to us. The power that you've been given to walk the Christian life, to walk life in general, to to be a blessing to others and not just curling in yourselves. The power that you've been given is like gold. It's treasure. The treasure of Jesus is within us. But we're just a plain old jar of clay. And we, we stopped by a, a, a potter. It's uh, on Route 100. I can't remember the name of the guy. Dan, something around there. And uh, he's got a lot of really cool stuff. It's like really big and kind of like whimsical and like he's got this amazingly beautiful pottery. I picked out like the plainest thing that I could find because <laughs> I'm not all that whimsical when it comes to pottery. Um, but he's got this amazingly beautiful pottery and but then of course in the back you've got the stuff that's not done yet that's just plain. And we're just like the plain jars of clay. Nothing special about us but the treasure that you have within you. Christ himself. That's God's great mystery. Christ in you. So that's why I play the hide and seek here with the kids. 
Because it talks more than once in our passage here about God's mystery. God's mystery for centuries. God's mystery was hidden. Where there was hints and there was clues and there was a story that was developing but nobody would have known what was really going to happen. That was God's mystery. How how is God going to reconcile us to himself? That's a mystery. And then God said, here is the mystery. Jesus Christ himself. And the mystery of Christ in us. Christ in you is God's mystery. And even when Jesus was on earth, he, he spoke very mysteriously. And he even said it like this. To you, that is his disciples at the time, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, to everybody else, it has not been given. At least not yet. When Jesus lived and died and rose again, the mystery was blown wide open. God is hiding in plain sight now. Do you see Jesus? God's great mystery is Christ in you. It's now, you might say, an open secret. Well, and the word mystery in the scriptures here is, uh, one of the scholars calls it like this, and un- it's undiscoverable except by divine revelation. Some of us may think, well, I don't get it why people don't really understand uh, Christianity, why they, why they don't want to follow Jesus. I don't get it. Well, in some sense, it's still it's a mystery because God has to open our eyes. God has to open our hearts. Only God can open our eyes. But when he does, we can say, yes, Lord, show me your mystery. So you and I, as we are in Christ, if you're not a believer yet, I, I hope you're on that path. And maybe today you can be. But for those of us who are right now, 1 Corinthians 4 says it like this. This is how we should be regarded as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. We're just servants, but yet we are stewards of God's mystery. God's mystery is that Jesus is in you. And Paul wanted to proclaim Jesus, to warn everyone, to teach everyone with wisdom, to present everyone mature in Christ. That's what I want for you and for myself, to be mature in Christ. God's great mystery, rejoicing in suffering. That's that's mysterious. In power for the struggle. We are just the jars of wind. We are the conduit that God is, is flowing through us. Christ is in you. So just one one thing about, I've, I've been repeating this theme, um, maybe because I'm the one that needs to hear it most. Maybe more than just me needs to hear it, but I've been repeating the theme of faith or fear. To me, that's, I, I find myself at that juncture. Faith or fear. Whenever something comes up. We've mentioned a bunch of things at, the, at our time for prayer. Those things are challenging. Are we going to take a step forward in faith? And say, Lord, I trust you. I I believe your promises. I may not understand everything right now, but I want to walk with you. Or are we going to take a step toward fear and let those... those, Where do those voices come from? Those voices that, that say... You know, you better think about this, or what about that, or that's going to happen, this is going to happen, you you just, you might as well, it just goes, and goes, and goes, and goes, and goes, until you're crushed. God wants to release us from the fear, and give us the faith to walk forward. Well, there's, someone recently uh, introduced me, or reintroduced me to Psalm 126, and just a few verses um, at the end of Psalm 126. And no, notice this uh, metaphor here. It says, Those who sow, and we'll conclude with this, those who sow in tears, who sow in tears, where it's, a, it's a farming metaphor, those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. 
Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Have your tears been sown? Not that long ago, many of you know the health struggles of our family, and it was so, so bad, and we were just weeping. We were weeping. But yet, those tears somehow fell into our our hearts, I guess you could say. And God is using that to grow joy. God's... I've heard it elsewhere. God plows our hearts with suffering. He kind of turns up the soil of our hearts. And and those tears... And and, and His love comes and plants the seed of joy. I want that for me. I want that for you. I want that even this week. Whatever comes ahead of you. Yes, sow in tears, but look for that joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy. We will have shouts of joy, even in our suffering. We can rejoice in our suffering because of God's great mystery, which is Christ in you. Let me pray for us. Father, we pray that you would give us faith. We are so often tempted to be afraid. But when we are afraid, we will trust in you. In God, whose whose name we praise, in God we trust, we will not be afraid. So thank you, Lord, that you are with us, that you have not forsaken us, that you will walk with us in our suffering. And would you help us to grab hold of the joy that you offer us, that you give us in Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Let's conclude our service by singing to God be the glory. It's hymn page 35. Hymn page 35, to God be the glory. Please sing with us.